something I tell my girls a lot is um, they will get be afraid of doing something or trying something new mm-hmm. or going somewhere new. And I will say, well, then do it scared. <laughs> right. That's good. Um, and do it scared. Do it scared then. And, and you know, they just think that I'm going to go, well, don't do it then. If, if that's going to mm-hmm. scare you, you're going to be scared of that. Don't do it. Yeah. Wait, yeah. You don't have to go. You don't have to do this. You don't yeah. have to say yes to this. But I, you know, tell them the opposite. Do it scared. Welcome to episode two of the Good News Show, a ministry of the Bellevue Church, where we explore the power of the gospel in the lives of real people. I'm Greg Falls, and in today's episode, I'm going to be discussing with many from our ministerial staff the subject of following your calling in life. Enjoy the show. Well, welcome everyone to the Good News Show. So glad that you're here, and so glad that you're joining us today for this episode of Uh, The Good News Show. We're talking about personal calling, answering your call, the call that God has on your life. I've been preaching about this for a couple weeks here at Bellevue, and uh, I wanted to bring uh, several from our ministerial team together to be able to discuss uh, this subject matter of personal calling. It's such a central part of each of our Christian lives, and I wanted you to hear not only from me, but from them as well. I want to introduce all of you that have come. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. And uh, we have here today, we have Tim Menser, who is our discipleship pastor. We have Kyle Watkins, who is our student uh, uh, pastor. We have uh, Erica Houston, who is our children's director, and we have our administrative pastor, Adam Neal. And... uh, You know, we talk a lot of times about personal calling and people's calling to ministry, to service, to to a, a, a particular task that God may call us to. The idea of calling uh, can be approached in a you know from a lot of different directions, and we hopefully will touch on several of those today. And uh, I think you guys are uniquely. Um, uh, you, you, you bring a unique perspective to the table because all of us, as well as others on our staff team, talk to people about discerning their personal calling in either one area of their life or the totality of their life all the time. Whether we're recruiting someone for a task that we really do believe they're called to, or whether we're helping them sort out what direction they need to go in life or the things they need to do or not to do, um, in order to fulfill their unique purpose in life. And you guys have years and years of experience of counseling people, helping people with this. So I really thank, am thankful that you are, are part of this conversation. Well, like I said before, uh, our church has been um, thinking about this and studying God's Word about this for the last few weeks. And I want to start us off with this question, and any of you can jump in and begin to answer In recent days, like I said, we've been discussing this issue of calling. In your experience and from your understanding of the Word of God, what is a calling? Well, a calling is a mixture uh, of things that that come about. I mean, um, God gives you certain gifts, uh, proclivities, talents that are unique to you um, that... uh, no one else may have exactly in the measure in which it's been given to you. And then seeing, thinking about the things that God has given you the ability to do. And then the second part kind of going with it is that you have immersed yourself in his word, therefore knowing uh, how those gifts, talents, proclivities can be used in a manner that is honoring to him. No. Um, and so those, finding a mixture uh, uh, of, how you take God's word to interpret that which you are, he's made you good at doing Uh um, is is like the starting point, I think, a lot of times for understanding what your calling is. And isn't it it so important to, I I like what you said too about the assumption that someone's immersed in God's word. I, I have a lot of times people come to me and they're like, I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do. But if you explore their lives, they're not digging into the Word of God. They may hear a sermon on Sunday, 
Uh, they may go to a life group and hear a Bible study. So they may have a few words recently lodged in their mind and their thinking, but they're not reading daily or near daily. They're not uh, seeking answers in the, in the scriptures specifically when they have questions. They're not going and saying, well, where could I find this? Or I'm going to do a word study. Um, and so they're not immersed in it. Whereas I find that when people, or even in my, I tend to even sense gr in greater measure God speaking to me when I'm spending my time in God's word, when it's fresh, when there's a lot of it and it's rolling around in there. It's amazing how much more I look at my life and the circumstances of my life and I know what I need to do, you know, so who, who else? Yeah, I, uh, I think kind of along those lines, you know, with uh, you know, diving into scripture, there's, there's also, there's an assumed intimacy with God that, mm. that comes along with that. Yeah, I, I've thought about this as, you know, we're kind of thinking through some of the mm -hmm. things we're going to talk about today that, you know, God will yell when he has to, mm -hmm. but he really likes to whisper. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the, the closer like you are to God, you know, the, the more intimate your relationship is with him um, through the reading of his word, through prayer, just, you know, through, through times of worship and experiencing God in different ways, the easier, not that it's easy, mm -hmm. but the easier it's going to be to, to begin to really hear, experience and pursue that calling because you're right there with them. You know, you, you, you're getting a better idea of what he's wanting in your life and what he wants from your life. And so mm -hmm. I think uh, you, you bring that into the, the mix and that, that really does make a, a significant difference in helping people figure out what it is that God's you know, leading mm -hmm. them to do. Yeah, yeah I think a, a key word is obedience. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, the one who loves me is the one who obeys. Mm -hmm. And so if, you know, a lot of times I've found that somebody wants to know, well, what does God want me to do with my life? Mm -hmm. um, well, are you obeying what God wants you to do today? Are, mm -hmm. you, are you following up on these things? Are you doing these things? Um, what is a calling? I think the question is that our calling is to obey him day by day, to follow mm -hmm. him day by day. Uh, Lynn Sweet, the, the author mm -hmm. and speaker back in the 90s, uh, yeah, yeah. He, he talked about a, a begging bowl type of Christianity, mm. that we like to live a daytimer Christianity. We like to have everything planned out, everything down. This is what I'm going to do for God. And he said, but really we should approach each day, not with our daytimer, but with a begging bowl to go to him with an empty bowl and say, God, mm -hmm. here's my day, you fill it. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a plan, we don't have things, right. but, but we open our life up to hear from him and to follow him moment by moment by moment. Uh, God's will is for us to do what he's telling us to do moment by moment. Mm -hmm. And then um, as we are faithful in small things, mm -hmm. He entrusts us with bigger things. We, yeah. we, we get a bigger picture of, okay, this is what he wants me to do next. Mm -hmm. This is what he wants me to do after that. So I, I think the key of, of understanding what God's will is, when you ask the question, what is God's will? It's loving him, hearing him, intimate time with him. But it's, it's obedience to mm -hmm. him. That's his will. And isn't it good news when you think about it that... Um, to so many of our people and, and, and just everyday Christians to know that you discover your calling in that obeying God's word, reading God's word, seeing opportunities to obey God's word and, and, and doing, you know, the Bible says, be um, doers of the word and not hearers only. And, and then when you're doing that and you just, cause I, I, I run into so many people that sometimes for years are frustrated because they're looking for that one thing that they think, they're, they're, yeah, am I called to anything? And they're looking for that one thing that's going to satisfy all of their longings for significance. And, um, and some secular uh, business models and things of that nature even present that paradigm of you've, you've got to find the one thing that you need to do and that you're going to put the preponderance of your energy and and there's some value to that in terms of use it you're playing to your strengths and all of that there it's not an unworthy conversation but i find that a lot of people 
think that maybe God doesn't have anything for them because they're looking for some word from on high about this one job that they're supposed to do that has a title. When I think all of us, even people who are called to vocational ministry, we have a lot of things God wants us to do. And the most profound things are reading his word and doing what it says. And our, we, we get to see our calling unfold in that. I, know. I think like a lot of people have uh, dovetailing off what you're saying, like this Cinderella syndrome, like where they think, you know, they're the Prince Charming of calls or, or the Cinderella <laughs> of calls, like yeah. is waiting out there and that it's going to be this grand moment <laughs> that God's going to speak. And this, this thing, as opposed to it's, it's a day, it's a daily it's a daily grind sometimes. I mean, but it, it, it's this daily thing, your call coming up where he's placed you. And again, knowing because you know his character that you're doing what you should be doing, but instead waiting for like, yeah, the divine moment, the voice on high, the, all these things to like come down and like, and then you'll know, you know, like all this magic happens and it's not usually yeah. like that for anybody. And, and so, um, Instead of sitting there and thinking, um, how is it that God has, has uh, moved in my life, worked in my life? What did I know about him that I'm confident about him? And then using those as my starting points. Jesus himself, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so therefore, mm -hmm. how do you find this out? Is listening to him uh, by reading what he's revealed of himself to us. Right, right. And it's accessible. That, that voice is accessible to all of us. Yes. To be able to, to hear that, you know, you read God's word, you do God's word, and your calling begins to unfold. Yeah. Um, well, that was, that was my journey and my calling to the pastorate. I, mm. When I was a disobedient high school and college <laughs> kid, I was not open to hearing God say, Tim, you're going to be a pastor. I, I wasn't, right. I wasn't spending time in his word. I wasn't spending time in prayer. And, uh, once I felt convicted about that and I started, I recognized his will was for me to know him mm -hmm. and I started spending time with him. Uh, it was in that time that I started sensing, well, God wants me to be involved in ministry in some way. Yeah. And, and so I, I got involved in, in, by vocational ministry. And from there, as, as that grew, I sensed, you know, uh, through time with him, I should go to seminary and I should prepare. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget. I was engaged to Jill at the time. Mm -hmm. It was a high risk conversation because I had to go to her and say, you know, I know we had planned to move to Nashville, pursue careers, make a lot of money, all that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, really sense God's calling me to be, to go to seminary. And she said, why? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's not to be a pastor. I'll never be a pastor. And, and she said, good, because I'll never be a pastor's wife. We weren't prepared at that point in time to hear that. And, and mm -hmm. God took each step of obedience to move us to our next step of obedience. Yeah, that's good. And um, so that got us to seminary, and it was halfway through seminary. I said, Jill, I sense God's calling me to be a pastor. And Jill said, Good, good for you. Um, I don't sense God's calling me to be a pastor's wife. Uh, and I joke about that. That really did happen. Um, but she, she knew that God was calling her to be a pastor's wife. She was just frightened about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we moved slowly forward in obedience as God led in that and opened doors for that. And, um, you know, it, it was a journey. I didn't wake up one morning and say, you know, I think God wants me to be a pastor. And then suddenly I was a pastor. It, right. It was a process. Yeah, that's good. The, uh, I, I think that that's something that we all need to see is that God, God only, usually only does what, what we're prepared to hear. Um, or when we're not prepared to hear, he's got other steps for us after that, you know, to, to, to lead us through. And, and you know, I think one thing, one danger of people in the ministry, talk, in vocational ministry, talking about these subjects is that it, our stories can sometimes be projected on folks that will never, are not called to do vocational ministry. They're called to do ministry. They're called to minister and minister within the church and minister out in the community. 
um, but they're not going to uh, have a job with that title. Let me um, interject in that, though. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more people who are called in vocational ministry and vocational missions mm -hmm. than who are responding. That's true, too. That's true, too. But I, what I want to make sure is that our hearers understand, too, that many people are called to a lot of things that, um, that never have a title. Like somebody may be called to um, take care of an elderly parent. Somebody may be called to take care of things that you would consider normal things, you know, things that you would even assume that you would do, that calling is a part of that too. God's put that in front of you uh, in order to take care of parenting. Parenting is a calling. Um, it is something that God wants us to do. The Bible talks all in all kinds of manners about how we're to obey God in our parenting. And um, I think that's something that's important. Let me, let me move on and, and uh, carry our conversation a little bit further. You know, we've established through our Sunday messages that God has a general calling for all of us to answer Christ's call of salvation. Like we have this general calling and to dedicate our lives to making the gospel known in the world. That's a general calling for, for every believer. But, but we've also discussed that God's word teaches that we each have a particular calling to uniquely serve the Lord and his cause in the world through our unique lives, our unique set of, mm -hmm. uh, it was already mentioned here, proclivities and, and uh, kind of uh, experiences. How do we discern our particular unique calling? I'll, I'll yeah. just say, you know, I, I hear um, it is looking to God's word is mm -hmm. what I'm feeling, this tug that I feel, the spirit tug that I feel from God. Um, is it aligned with God's word? That's number mm -hmm. one. But I've also seen in my life sometimes where it just completely doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and where something I will be called to do something that I know is beyond what I can do. Mm -hmm. And so that um, it's such a mixed bag sometimes of what mm -hmm. a calling can be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think of the people who their calling is, you know, married to a teacher, um, an administrator mm -hmm. now, and who was a coach for 20 years and, and how um, maybe at first he didn't see that was his calling mm -hmm. to, um, that that was his mission field, mm -hmm. you know, with these athletes, with these students and the impact now that as an administrator, students coming back and speaking and my kids went to dinner with him recently and said, I think I couldn't even count the m number of times that people were approaching dad and saying, talking about the impact that he's had. So there are so many things sometimes that, mm -hmm. that it is a talent. It is even, um, it is a, just a desire that God mm -hmm. has given to us. Like I, for me, I love um, studying God's word um, and really breaking it down mm -hmm. and, and um, looking at what, thinking of ways that I can share it, that it makes sense mm -hmm. to the masses. We'll right. say, yeah. I don't know. And, and, um, I, and I re I've just realized that through the years, that is something of just really breaking down God's word. Mm -hmm. And, and then it all makes sense when, oh, okay, it's with kids. That's where you want me, Lord. Mm -hmm. Um, but then sometimes it's the, you know, speaking in public stuff <laughs> for myself, which is something that I don't want to do. I don't mm -hmm. wake up saying, oh, I hope God gives me an opportunity to stand in front of a large crowd and, and do this. And, throughout my um, adult life, there have been so many circumstances mm -hmm. where that has happened. And um, even the kids' messages that I was mm -hmm. doing for a year or a little over mm -hmm. a year, and just being able to see that was beyond me. That was beyond what I had comfort in. That was beyond what I felt that I had the ability in and the gifting in. That was where God said, I'm going to take these things that you, that you do see and you do have comfort mm -hmm. in that is a gift. And I'm going to make you go beyond what you can do. So it's, it is just such a mixture for people. And, but it takes just a daily obedience, a daily intimacy with God and being with him because the calling um, is not always a big Cinderella thing. Mm -hmm. It is sometimes a, this family member, I need you to share 
Christ with. I need you to be investing in them. This neighbor, I need you checking on them Mm -hmm. and loving on them and being, having a purposeful relationship with them. So it's, you uh, you know, one of the things that you seem to hint at there is that uh, calling a lot of times takes something that we know, that we know that we can do. We even have some confidence, but cause, cause, calls us to stretch ourselves in applying that into domains that maybe we're not comfortable with, mm-hmm. that stretching it to the next level. Um, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, I know that there are, there's things in my life even now that I go, wow, I'm comfortable with applying my calling in this way, but I'm feeling like a prompt to, to go and stretch it out into another domain or or take it to a new level or place, and I'm nervous about it, scared about it. And I see that in people all the time, you know, to, to go and say, gosh, if I apply this in a different way or, or maybe do something I've always wanted to do but never thought I could and, and I'm nervous about it. I mean, how do you, how do you think about that? Well, I, <clears throat> I think one of the... the misunderstandings that oftentimes when people are coming up and asking about callings and all and and all this comes together is they're thinking about this thing where they have this uh content satisfaction and and (laughs) and uh kind of i don't know a bliss to things because they they they've answered this calling that's that's the like Mm -hmm. sensation and 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 they're happy with all of it when calling is I, I can't think of an example. I've been sitting here trying to think where it's always sacrificial. I mean, like every every time, like everybody up here, including yourself, all of us could have been doing something else in life. And like Tim, I, I wanted to be anything other than a pastor. I mean, even when I said I was going to seminary, I said never to be a pastor, though. That's not why I'm going to seminary. And that oftentimes then we don't listen, we don't do the thing that we know that we are supposed to do because it is hard, because it is sacrificing um, time or, or to do other things that may be more pleasurable. It, it's not, calling's not always pleasurable. It, it's it, doing the right thing, doing that which is um, God honoring, mm-hmm. that, that brings forth um, uh, God to be seen is more often than not something where you had to give up something that was valuable to you Mm. in order to do it. I mean, and then like the disciples, I mean, like Peter was probably a lot more comfortable fishing than Mm -hmm. running up and getting in front of people. Right, right, Uh, right. He knew how to fish. He knew how to clean the nets. He knew what time he was supposed to go out in the morning, where he was supposed to go and all that. And then he doesn't do it anymore. And now he's doing something that, that, you know, Uh it's, it's sacrificial. Um, And so you have to show that your calling is worth something because that's what we all want it to be worth something. Mm-hmm. Well, then you had to pay with something. Yeah. You had to give up something it, else. Isn't that, um, let's talk about that a little bit about obstacles um, because sometimes our comfort zone with something can become the obstacle to mm-hmm. venturing out and trying something new or allowing your life to be disrupted because you're answering a call, right? So um, what are some obstacles that we face when, we, when we're in, encountering the choice to answer a call or not answer a call? I'll, I'll tell you one. I, I think Adam was kind of heading this way with it. I, it it's subtle, but mm. I think it, for a lot of us, I, I think you know, all of us at times included in this as well, one obstacle we have is a slight misunderstanding of what blessing is mm. from God. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so there, there's this, you know, part of the discontent that we, you know, we, that we're, we're, we're having to, to sacrifice things and we want that feeling of, ah, and yeah. you don't always get the, ah, when you're doing what God wants you to do. Right. The blessing is in knowing that you're doing what God wants you to yes. do. And, you know, we, treasures in heaven and, and all these things that we know are down the road. There's, there's, there's subtle blessing, but we don't often get the blessing that we expect mm-hmm. or the blessing that we really desire when we are obediently following God's call in our life. So mm-hmm. that, I think, can trip us up sometimes yeah. because we think, well, I must be outside of God's will or I'm not doing what God's called me to do. Right. Because I don't feel the way I thought I was supposed to feel in doing it. Mm. 
and it's a challenge. I mean, I, I know for myself, I, I deal with that. I mean, working mm -hmm. with students is a it's a very difficult calling mm -hmm. because you typically don't see what you want to see right away until they are completely different people down the road yeah and sometimes you don't like what you see then so it's, <laughs> you know but but the the blessing for me is is it and it's something i've had to grow in yeah um it, it's not okay wow this kid's been coming to youth they got saved they're going to become a missionary. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not those things. It's, you know, it's much more subtle than that. It's, mm -hmm. I was faithful. I yeah. was obedient. My blessing comes from the time I'm spending with God where he's reassuring my spirit yeah. and he's calling me again the next day to continue in ministry. Mm -hmm. That's the blessing. I think it's what you, what you said is really gold. And, and I hope that those of you that are watching this show are, really allow this to become a part of your following your calling tool bag, you know, something that you can draw from later on is the, the understanding that answering your calling is not always bliss. That, um, uh, now there are times when like I'm in the zone, right? You know, like where everything, the planets align, you know, in your calling and, and you have those sweet times where you see results and, or you just have that amazing feeling of being on your A game, doing what God uniquely called you to do and what you have to offer, what God's told you in his word and what the world needs all come colliding beautifully, dovetailing together, right? You know, so there's times like that, but sometimes those are like mountaintop times, but there's, there's like this long, deep, you know, extended valley in between each of those mountaintops where the daily grind of following your calling is, whether it's raising kids at home, uh, engaging in the marketplace, bringing the gospel uh, to the mission field, uh, uh, being a part of church life, volunteering in a life group at, 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 at church. All of those things have these, this grind, this work to them too. I can remember a lot of crucible moments in my following my calling as a pastor, both at this church and at other churches too, over the last three and a half decades, many, many times where I was going through a crucible that would make me want to quit, that, that I maybe even had justifiable reasons to say, this isn't good for me, I'm going to stop. But I would have those arrest, soul arresting moments, you know, the paralyzing moments where you, you just freeze and you go, uh but I'm called to this. Yeah. I can't leave this when God put me here and he hasn't made me leave yet. And so I have to gut through this yeah. and find God in the midst. And what, when you do that, you discover more your calling. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's when you keep at it, when you know that God hasn't moved you uh, from whatever task he's got you, that you really then you learn your calling even more. That's a part of your call. The tough thing is part of your calling. So. Let me add, Greg, uh, something that I see often in my years of pastoring, and it's, it's something that we all run into from time to time, is sometimes we get so caught up in the mundane and just living life mm -hmm. that maybe we kind of know what God wants us to do, mm -hmm. but we're busy with kids. We're busy with our job. We're, we're tired, and we think... I'll get to that at some point in time. Our time with God maybe mm -hmm. is is decreasing. We we push him away a little bit more. I, I think of, you know, we just came out of Easter. Mm -hmm. And I think about uh, Jesus in the garden when he's praying. And he mm -hmm. goes back to the disciples. And they're asleep. They're tired. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not expecting something unexpected. They're just, it's just another night with Jesus, you know. And he's like, look, you need to pray. Watch and pray. Uh, because you know, you're, lest you fall into temptation. Right, right. And that watch and pray, I think, is something we overlook sometimes. We mm. need to be watching because the tempter wants to derail us from what God wants us mm -hmm. to do. Uh, we need to pray. There's something supernatural that happens within us, a strength from that time with God. Um, and, and, and the disciples didn't watch and pray. Mm -hmm. right. Jesus did watch and pray. He saw his betrayer coming. Mm -hmm. The disciples just saw another one of their own coming. Yes. Um, 
so they weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They failed in the test. Jesus did not fail in the test because he watched and prayed. And, and with all of this, the point I'm leading to is the disciples failed. They missed the calling of the day. I, you, you can say it was preordained for these things to happen in this way. I, I happen to think it was, uh, but they weren't prepared. <clears throat> but even though they failed in that moment, God didn't say, well, you missed your calling. Right. I'll get 12 it's all more. Gone. Yeah. Um, 11 of those guys rose up when they were called again. Mm hmm and sought to be obedient. And uh, so if somebody's out there thinking, you know, I think God called me to do this 10 years ago or whatever, and, and I didn't do it, and I've, I've missed that opportunity, God doesn't throw us away because we're disobedient. So you can, word. if you're 75, 85 years old, you still have a calling on your life. God's mm -hmm. not done with, with what He has for you. And, and uh, you can still rise up and say, God, let me be obedient today. You, you, you didn't miss that opportunity. Right. I and, had a, yes, go oh, ahead, Erica. I had a season in my life that I went from being an executive director of a nonprofit to a stay-at-home mom simply because of a tug. And I can remember tearfully just telling my husband one day, like, I'm supposed to quit my job. Mm -hmm. And him going, you are what? <laughs> and this wasn't in our plan. This wasn't in our, this was my calling was this being, you know, direct directing this uh, Christian nonprofit. That was a calling. That was when he married me. This is what I was doing. There was never a conversation because I loved my job. Um, being a stay at home mom was not full of daily blessings <laughs> and, and bliss. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. but I had a peace mm -hmm. that I can just say that you don't always, um, there are callings that we have in our life during seasons that um, you can look back and go somehow, how do I have peace even in this where it, I'm missing adult conversations? This feels very mundane. This feels very, I, I feel like I don't have my purpose, living out my purpose right now. And, and luckily I'm, you know, can see back and go, oh my goodness, what a sweet time that was. And I would never trade it. And I was sharing with a mom, a Bellevue mom, just past Sunday about that season of living on love, you know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. there was no eating out. There was no, yeah. you know, there were so many sacrifices. So if you made this list of um, God's blessings, you know, should, uh, you should feel financial peace. You should feel, mm -hmm. you know, um, for financial blessings, you should feel um, daily fulfillment. You should feel all these things like I did not have that, but I had a peace that I was exactly where where God wanted me. Yeah, yeah. Good. And I think what everybody's built towards and, and what's being said is like the, the strange thing about it is what did the disciples then in Acts, how did they know they were doing as they should? Because they rejoiced that they suffered like Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was their, that's how they knew they were doing the right thing. They, they rejoiced that they too got to suffer like he suffered. Mm -hmm. Like they that was their mark, like of knowing, yeah. and as opposed to it being bliss and contentment, it was like we saw them do this to Jesus. He told us that they would do this to us, and now they're doing it to us. We must be doing what we're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. Like, like, yeah. and that is antithetical oftentimes to how we think God is showing us that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and and I believe too that if we'll embrace the hard as well, um, as gracefully as we can. And maturity usually has to work its way over decades to do that. Um, the blissful times when they come are all the more deep and rooted in the soil of, of, of the challenge. Because they're in God himself and not in the gifts. Yeah, and God's not just in the blessings. You yes, know, we sir. say things, oh, God's good. Like somebody gets healed and we go, oh, God's good. Well, was God not good when the person was struggling with the chronic illness? Right. Is God not good then, but is he good, you know, and is he good to you when you're answering the call and everything's going smoothly and you're successful? Or 
is he not also good when he is in the crucible moment with you mm-hmm. of failure, of difficulty, of challenge, or of just, um, you know, some plateau that, that you know, where, where you just feel stuck in the wilderness. When you look at the Bible, you see all kinds of wilderness experiences by God called people who are obeying the Lord in that moment. And I think we need to understand that. I, I want to move uh, as we, we kind of near an, an end to the conversation here. I want us to talk about fear because fear so many times keeps people from answering the call, a call to do a simple thing today. You know, it might be, I um, feel the tug on my heart to go and talk to my neighbor about Jesus or um, to go and have this conversation or, or whatever, all the way to, oh, I think we're supposed to move to another town and city, you know, I, all or of country. The, yeah, <laughs> right. So all of that, there's fear that a lot of times causes, grips us. What would you say to someone that who is got some measure of clarity of what they're supposed to do, but they're afraid and they're paralyzed in that moment, what would you tell them? That's normal. <laughs> okay, it's normal? Yeah, like we all, it's, it's, yeah. you're not special, right? <laughs> you're feeling what we all feel, mm-hmm. yeah. I'd say that um, fear, well, I mean, perfect love drives out all fear, but it's grounding yourself in that God was good enough. You believe the promise that God says to you, um, you call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. You believe that, that Jesus dies for your sins. You believe that he rose from the grave. You believe these things, but then do you believe why he did that for you? Because he didn't save you for that to be the end. He saved you to do something. So the driving out of the fear is just as surely as you believe that Jesus' blood saves you um, from the wrath of God and hell and all eternity. If just as much do you then believe that he saved you to do the good works which he prepared mm. beforehand that you would walk in them. That's good. It, 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 and that's how you drive it out. It, it's so your confidence that God, when Jesus says it's finished, when Jesus says this is what I'm going to do and I've done it, do you believe that he has done that in you, that he's done that to you, that you are to do these things. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's how you overcome, I, I think, the fear because otherwise everything else will just eat you up because you just mm-hmm. think, well, he saved me, but I, I don't know what to do now. He tells you what to do now, to, to, be, to be like him. To, yeah. to, 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 and so, and is he lying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you trust him for this, trust him for this too mm-hmm. then. Do, um, should we wait until the fear dissipates before we step forward? No, I, I, I was going to say, I, I think one of the things you have to do regarding fear is the same thing we've been talking about the whole time. Mm-hmm. You took steps to recognize what God's calling was on your life. You may not be comfortable with that, what that calling is, but you took steps to get there. Mm-hmm. Now your responsibility is to, in intimacy and a love for God's word, Mm -hmm. diving in, knowing him, loving him, to take the next step. That next step may not be every step, but it's the next step. Mm -hmm. You take that next step to do what he's called you to do. And then you take the next step. I I, I had a pastor at a a previous church who used to tell me all the time that, you know, when you were struggling with your calling, you needed to ask yourself yourself, a few questions. Are you a Christian? Are you called to ministry? And are you called to this church? Mm-hmm. And he would tell me that all the time. And there are many days I wasn't really sure how to answer those questions, but, <laughs> but it's the reality of, you know, one of the things I love about our relationship with God, especially when it comes to calling is he doesn't just call us once. Yeah. You know, when he yeah. told Abraham to leave, he didn't tell him where to go. Right. And so he was showing him along the way. Yeah. And so, you know, when God calls us to something, whether it's something huge or small, or something that's exciting, or something that's scary, he's still going to show us along the way. We just have to be close to him, mm-hmm. and yeah, it's still going to be scary. And we don't always get the there. whole plan right ahead of time. I mean, you're hinting to that, uh, hinting at that right in your words, is that you know, there's time, sometimes people, not every person, but the, pe- the persons that are inclined to want to have a lot of control over the future or have a sense of where they're going in order to be comfortable, um, they will 
they, they will want, and I have to throw myself in there too, I've, I've done this myself, is I want to know what it's all going to be like. What's the plan, God? Like, what's the whole plan? When sometimes the whole plan is, well, like Abraham, leave your country and go to the land I'll show you. Well, where is that? <laughs> How many miles? We, you know what? Uh, I'll show you. It's like that passage of Scripture in Psalms. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Not a high beam that can <laughs> extend out, you know, with an LED light, you know, uh, a half a mile into, you know, ahead of the road, but enough flickering illumination to let you know what your next step is when you come upon that step. Well, God's calling us into a relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the thing. And, and if he gave us the whole map, the whole picture, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to listen to him anymore. We wouldn't No. what he wants, what he desires is to be in relationship with yeah. us. So day by day by day, seeking him, following him, and, and saying, okay, God, you know, and, and not even just day by day, moment by moment. Uh, you know, he, he may uh, lead me to Starbucks, I like to think, you know, or some <laughs> coffee shop somewhere. Uh, but it may not be to get coffee ne necessarily. It may be to talk to the barista that's mm -hmm. there uh, about the relationship with Christ or about the hope that I have in me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why, uh, you know, I'm there. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's following him step by step, day by day, uh, I think is, and, and you're, you're never, you're never sure. I mean, you're, you, you get a peace inside of you, but there's always a fear mm -hmm. of, well, what if this happens or what if, you know, this falls apart or what right. if the provision's not there, you know, and, and, uh, the provision as we understand it. Right. Um, and it, you know, I, I've learned when, when we lived in Africa, uh, I learned that people can actually live on very little mm -hmm. and have a lot of happiness in them. Mm -hmm. Um, and as Americans, we have a hard time wrapping our mind around that. That's true. Um, so as we follow him, what's the worst that could happen? We may lose everything, but maybe find a greater level of satisfaction than we ever understood mm -hmm. and a greater level of dependence upon God and a greater closeness and intimacy in him that we never would have experienced yeah. had we hung on to our stuff right. or whatever it is we were afraid yeah. we were going to Because it's lose. not always things. Sometimes it's a relationship or, relationships, or right. a pattern of life that is predictable. And right. Yeah. You know, the, the, when we talk about fear, I think what people are afraid of the most when they are asked by God to step into something new um, or something that stretches them or something that applies them or is that sacrifice that you've mentioned. There's something that's got to change. Whatever it might be, it might be a change or it might be something we give up or, you know, um, and we don't know what we're going to receive. You know, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So if we go and we let go of certain things in order to embrace God in something that he's called us to do, he's promised to provide for us in that other thing. But it's a lot of times uh, it's what we are familiar with is more attractive to us than what we don't know is around the corner that God is going to bless us with, that he's promised in his word, and we're afraid. And I think that one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to be willing to take everything that we have in our life, and I've not always been good at this, and have an open-handed approach to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think about how Abraham was called to sacrifice Isaac and God was not going to let him follow through with it. I mean, it's contrary to God's word to sacrifice your child, literally. And, but Abraham, and there's indication in the text that Abraham had confidence that Isaac was going to be okay. But he also knew he needed to be relinquishing of his son to the Lord. That the, Isaac was his most prized relationship in life. He had been waiting decades for Isaac to come into his life. And now Isaac and he had a special relationship. It was his legacy. And he had to also release that person as well. And um, 
And that's all the Lord wanted is to know that we were willing. I think that there's sometimes we're supposed to stay where we are doing something, um, but God wants us to be able to say, are you willing to say that I could take that from you if you want? Am I more important than that thing that you're familiar with? And then there's other things that we need to be willing to relinquish because at any moment he may cause us to relinquish them because he has something else for us that he won't tell us about until we take that step of faith and move forward. And I don't know any other way, and I think you guys have confirmed it, I don't know any other way to address fear other than to walk through it and walk in it and embrace it. Something I tell my girls a lot is um, they will get be afraid of doing something or trying something new mm -hmm. or going somewhere new. And I will say, well, then do it scared. <laughs> right. That's good. Um, and do it scared. Do it scared then. And, and you know, they just think that I'm going to go, well, don't do it then. If, if that's going to mm -hmm. scare mm -hmm. you, you're going to be scared of that. Don't do it. Yeah. Wait, yeah. You don't have to go. You don't have to do this. You don't yeah. have to say yes to this. But I, you know, tell them the opposite, do it scared. And I will explain the times of how many things I've had to do and do it even yeah. with fear while scared yeah. while, and, and again, it's one of those things where it's beyond me and it's, it's then going, okay, th this God is in your hands. Cause I'm too scared to do this. So you have to take over right now and, and allow this to happen. So that's what I think of Abraham that yeah. he, he did it scared somehow with confidence because the confidence uh -huh. of this intimate relationship he had with God, but he, he did it scared, you know, of bringing I, him to I that. I think what you said is so good. I, I think you've just given us our great best closing comment here. Do it scared. <laughs> and if there's anything that I can challenge you to do, and we can all challenge you, is to follow God, even if you got to do it scared. Um, be willing to... Um, let go of the things that maybe God's calling you to let go of in order to embrace a task or a calling that God has for you. And maybe you don't know how he's going to work all out, out all the details and you're a little scared. Then do it scared and live that out. What you'll find a lot of times is that the, God, the, 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 the word is true when, when Paul wrote to Timothy and said, that we have not been given a spirit of timidity but, or of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. Uh, we need to follow God's call, even if we got to do it scared. Well, you all, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. And we're going to do more of these uh, as we work through this series and uh, 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 our sermon series, What the Bible Says About My anxiety, my calling, my parenting, and all of those things. Uh, we're going to have more of these good news shows so that we can dialogue about um, uh, uh, practical ways to apply the truth of God. So once again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being a part of it. And follow God's call, even if you got to do it scared. <laughs>